Hello and welcome to One Academy, India's largest online learning platform. And I welcome you to crack CA exams with us, the vertical of One Academy that caters to the students of CA Foundation, CA Intermediate, and the CA Final uh, students to help them in their pursuit and journey of preparation for the CA Foundation, CA Intermediate, and the CA found and the CA Final examination. So I welcome all of you and. Uh, uh, come, let's crack CA exams with Unacademy, India's largest online learning platform. Uh, before we proceed, uh, a little, little brief introduction about the educator today. Uh, hello, I'm Pratik Gupta. I'm a Bachelor of Commerce from Christ College, Bangalore University. I'm an associate member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, an associate member of the Institute of Cost Accountants of India, and an associate member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. I'm also a law graduate from Karnataka State Law University and currently a practicing chartered accountant. I'm also a visiting faculty for CA students and an educator for CA students both offline and online. Uh, prior to starting on my own, I worked with SR Bartleba and Associates, that is the Indian member firm of Ernst & Young Global in the Audit and Assurance Department. And then I worked with Ernst & Young India in the Mergers and Acquisitions Department. And then I went on to work with the Manipal Group Bangalore and was the corporate controller of the Indian entity as well as the German subsidiary located in Frankfurt, Germany. It was after I got back from Frankfurt, Germany that I decided to start something on my own. And uh, here I am today getting this opportunity to be in front of you to take this session for, for a very fine and young and enthusiastic bunch of CA Aspira aspirant students. So welcome to my session and I hope you find it useful and your feedback is always welcome. Now the Unacademy platform, once, just once. The Unacademy uh, platform, which is uh, the largest online learning platform in India, right now provides uh, its courses and its resources on three platforms. First is on YouTube that I'm taking for you right now. The second one are special classes. Which are, which are conducted on the Unacademy learning app, which again, I will be telling you a little further. And, and lastly, and most importantly, it has the Plus platform, which is a payment-based subscription model, which opens your world to the courses, resources, content that Unacademy has to offer you in your preparation for the CA intermediate and uh, foundation exam. So in the Plus platform of Unacademy, what do you get? Uh, firstly, you get daily live classes where you get to choose your educator, your topic, you get to uh, choose to uh, chat with the educator, engage in discussions, ask your doubts and answer polls. All this while the class is going on. Yes, you heard it right. All this while the class is going on. You do not need to wait for the end of the session. You do not need to wait for the weekend or you do not need to wait for another day to ask your doubts. You can clear your doubts and discuss with your educator as he's and imagine as if he's standing in front of you. You can just raise your hand and you can ask him your questions, your doubts and your educator will be more than happy to answer your doubts and address your concerns. So this is for the first and one of the main advantages of the Plus platform of Unacademy. Secondly, the Plus platform of Unacademy conducts various live tests and quizzes on its platform which help you evaluate your preparation. Now, how is it done? With, with the help of the regular mock tests and quizzes that the Plus platform of Unacademy conducts, you get detailed analysis of your performance from time to time. Now, what do, what do the detailed uh, analysis of your performance help you? Or how does it help you? The detailed performance of yours from time to time that you get helps you understand your weak areas, your strong areas and your not so strong areas. Now, by identifying your weak areas, your not so strong areas and your strong areas, you can in turn divert and channelize your time. towards making your weak areas and your not so strong areas into your strong areas, thereby maximum utility of your time. Hence, these live tests and quizzes help you to better prepare for the examinations and identify your uh, core areas. Thirdly, the courses provided, uh, provided by the Plus platform of Academy are structured courses. We say they are structured courses because all the courses are structured in line with your exam syllabus to help you prepare for it. So in case you have gone through a, a Plus course on the Academy. Uh, plus platform, then you can you can be reasonably certain that you've completed the entire syllabus of your examination, which in your case will be the CA foundation and the CA intermediate uh, examination without missing out any important or major points. And uh, lastly, and most importantly, the plus platform of Unacademy gives you unlimited access 
that means the one subscription to the plus platform of one academy gives you unlimited access to all the live and recorded courses to watch from the comfort of any of your devices that means you can watch it either on your mobile phone on your tablet on your laptop or your desktop whatever device you choose you can watch it on them and there is no restriction on the timing and the place you can watch it wherever you want whenever you want without any restrictions so this i think is one of the main factors why you should consider uh, enrolling onto the plus platform of an academy soon we will talk about more details about them in the coming slides moving on uh, now to access your uh, special classes and your plus platform you need the an academy learning app now for those of you who have downloaded the an academy learning app and are using it i thank you very much and i request your support in the future as well and for those of you who have not yet downloaded the an academy learning app i request you to go to your play store and download the an academy learning app okay so once the an academy learning app is downloaded on your um uh, phone you need to click on the install button and then it installs and then you get an otp on your mobile number once you enter your mobile number using this otp you need to register on the unacademy learning app now what happens once you register once you register on the unacademy learning app using your mobile phone and the otp you open your gateway to the world of courses resources content live and recorded uh, sessions that an academy has to offer you in order to enhance and accelerate your preparation for the ca foundation and intermediate examinations so the, the special classes platform is open to you and the plus and the door to the plus platform is also open to you by uh, registering on the an academy learning app more details about subscribing for the plus platform are in the following slides so for, for once again uh, for those of you who have already downloaded the an academy learning app and are using it i thank you very much and i request your support in the future and i am very sure that uh, you are benefiting a lot from the an academy learning app and from those of you who have not yet downloaded the an academy learning app i request you to download it from your play store and register on it using your mobile number and otp and while doing that if you have any questions or any doubts you can always get in touch with the concerned people and they will help you out in your registration on the an academy learning app so i hope to see you there soon now like i told you the plus platform a fun academy is a payment based subscription model which provides you various packages for the various mm -hmm. courses uh, as i'm part of the ca foundation and intermediate subscription the uh, packages provided by the plus platform of fun academy for the ca foundation and intermediate subscription are as follows you have a package for 1 month 3 months 6 months 12 months and 24 months the 1 month package costs you rupees 3500 the 3 months package costs you rupees 8750 The six-month package costs you rupees fourteen thousand. The twelve-month package costs you rupees seventeen thousand five hundred, and the twenty-four-month package costs you rupees twenty-one thousand. I personally would recommend to you to go for the twelve months and twenty-four months uh, package for two reasons. Firstly, it is cost-effective. If you see the per-month cost of the one-month package, uh, that is about three thousand five hundred, and you see the per-month cost of the twelve-month package or the twenty-four-month package, it's almost less than one-third of the one-month. package cost so i personally recommend you to go for the 12 months or 24 months and one more reason for this is as the ca foundation and the intermediate plans are being provided under one subscription it makes sense for you to go for at least 12 months because the ca foundation and the intermediate exams normally take about a year's time for you to prepare and clear so that way if you go for the 12 month package you get major savings in terms of cost as well as you get the subscription for the various for the complete duration of your courses but while doing so while choosing the package of your choice please do not forget to use the code pratik p r a t h i k to get a discount of 10% on the listed price so the after discount prices of the various packages are the one month package will cost you rupees 3150 the three month package will cost you rupees 7875 the six month package will cost you rupees 12600 the 12 month package will cost you rupees 15750 and the 24 months package will cost you rupees 18900 so there you see you immediately get a discount of 10% of the listed price as soon as you use my code pratik p r a t h i k and having said this i still recommend you to go for the 12 months or the 24 months package uh for the reasons of cost effectiveness and getting two packages in the price of one and uh, for the entire duration of one year all right so please do consider this and please do join the uh, plus platform of an academy in order to enhance and accelerate your preparation for the um CA foundation and the intermediate uh, examinations
all right so now how do we get this once you download the unacademy learning app on your mobile phones uh, once you register and enter into it you get a section where you get courses so under the courses you get the option of special classes or plus courses you need to click on plus courses choose your package put the code pratik p r a t h i k and then you get a discount on the uh, listed price and then you can proceed with the subscription uh, please do let me know in case you're facing any problem while uh, going through your subscription now before i start off the session today like i told you that the dan academy is present on youtube on uh, special classes and plus platform about the plus platform i told you in the previous slide now let's talk about the special classes now special classes are uh, sessions taken on important topics by various expert educators on the an academy platform and these are absolutely free of cost there is no cost for these and uh, here are some of the sessions that i have taken among many so i have taken sessions on revision revision test papers for may 2019 for business laws uh, issued by the institute of chartered accountants of india i have taken sessions on sale of goods act 1930 i have taken sessions on indian contract act 1872 and the companies act 2013 now if you see here you'll see part 1 part 2 part 1 part 3 it means these are a part of the various topics the total of the topics that have been put here so in order to view them you will have to download the unacademy learning app register yourself and go on to view these sessions and like i said they are absolutely free of cost and uh, these are among the many sessions that i have taken the many special classes that i have taken on the youtube on the unacademy platform so i request all of you to download the unacademy uh, learning app and uh, make use and enjoy the benefits of these various free free special classes which are located there now as so a few of you might uh, find it difficult or might be finding it difficult to get on to the unacademy learning app these are the links of few of the sessions that i have taken so i have provided you the link for the indian contracts act the sale of goods act the indian partnership act the limited liability partnership act the companies act basics of communication accounting concepts revision test papers may 2020 similar to may 2020 i have taken uh, special classes for the revision test papers may 2019 november 2019 november 2018 so you can just click on these links and that will take you to those various special classes on the an academy learning app platform and then you can make use of this so i really hope to see all of you there very soon and i also hope you benefit from this so in case you have any feedback or any queries please feel free to contact me and uh, uh, give me your feedback and your uh, queries and i will be happy to answer them all right so uh, just take about a minute go through this and then we proceed okay so now the session today that we are going to take is on uh, indian contracts act 1872 and the agency relationship now for for those of you who have not attended my session earlier or who have not gone through my special class i have taken a session on indian contracts act 1872 and this is in the form of a special class that i have taken on the an academy learning app and this is a this is a solid 3 hour session that is there explaining each concept of the indian contracts act 1872 in detail so that you benefit from it and which will help you also in your preparation for the exam and the link also is provided for this session in the previous slide so i request all of you uh, who want to know more about the indian contracts act 1872 and details of its uh, Uh, various concepts and sections i request you to click on that link and go and uh, attend those sessions and in case after attending that you have any questions or any doubts please feel free to ask me let me just erase this for you all right so now this is to do with uh, the indian contracts act so today's session we are going to discuss about the agency relationship and basically what is going to be in today's session is uh, when an agent
when an agent is appointed by the principal the interrelationship between the two rights duties and obligations of the principal and the agent and also the interrelationship between the two as to how are they related and what are the characteristics of their relationship so entire session today is going to be on uh, the agency the principal agency principal agent relationship and how it works so anytime during the session also in case you have any questions anything to ask me please ask me and um, i will let you know and also i want one point before i uh, move on that uh, on this sunday i will be taking a lot of other special classes on the unacademy learning platform on various topics that will be of interest to the ca foundation and ca intermediate students so i request you to download the unacademy app learning app as soon as possible and uh, follow my profile and also get on and uh, see you on this sunday with the various special classes that i have scheduled in line for you to benefit and make the most of it all right so i look forward to seeing you in my special classes on sunday having said this i will be taking a lot of other youtube sessions uh today tomorrow and for the rest of the week notifications of which will be provided to you uh basically for this whole week i am taking uh, youtube sessions for you from uh, 9 pm to 11 pm on various topics of your choice and for the next uh, two days i will be taking youtube sessions from 5 pm to 7 pm and 9 pm to 11 pm on topics that will be of interest to you and help you in your examinations so today tomorrow day after tomorrow there will be youtube sessions on um, uh, at 5 pm and 7 pm and then at 9 pm and 11 pm again and uh, uh, the whole of uh, next week again you will have youtube sessions at the same time so i look forward to seeing all of you there so let's start off with the session okay now uh, introduction an agency relationship is established an agency relationship is established when one party agent is authorized by another party principal this one say to act on his or her behalf such relationships are initiated when one party desires to extend his or her business activity beyond his or her present limits or capacity in modern life, it would be virtually impossible for a business to function efficiently without agents. All right, so let's try and understand this example or this concept, the introduction with an example. Let's say you run a, uh, you have a shoe manufacturing uh, outlet in any part of India. Let's say in Delhi, you have a shoe manufacturing outlet and trading. So you manufacture and sell shoes in the city of Delhi. So in the state of Delhi so so your business is going on very well you are happy and you know it's going on but there reaches a certain point in time where you think no I need to expand my business then I'm getting a good demand because there are a lot of foreign tourists who come there and this thing I'm getting a lot of demand so uh, it's good you know if I'm selling an amount of shoes but I need to increase that I'm not I can expand my business now you have two choices let's say then you want to come to Bangalore and open an outlet in Bangalore so you have two choices either you come to Bangalore here look for a small shop or look for a big outlet do the interiors do everything take it on rent or purchase it as the case may be hire some people uh, so fixed cost of salary is incurred and then the regular repairs maintenance and the daily house the housekeeping expenses and then you put your uh, shoes here you display it to them and then people come and buy the shoes that is a way of doing it as well but how many cities can you eventually do it now there is a limit right because there is a capital infusion that is required and in case you are not funded and in case uh, you're doing it all on your own so so then there will be a constraint of capital requirement as well so in this case what can you do you can actually go ahead and appoint an agent in bangalore okay so you can come to bangalore and you can appoint an agent in bangalore who will sell shoes on your behalf so this agent will sell on your behalf so what does it do so you get you come here you catch hold of a person in Bangalore and you say okay uh, listen I'm manufacturing and selling shoes in Delhi but now I want to get customers in Bangalore as well 
because that's a good market and there's a lot of population here uh, and there is IT crowd and this crowd so uh, they will buy my shoes so you come and appoint an agent here and uh, you say for every shoe that you sell I will give you a 10% commission on the sale price so let's say the price of the shoe is a uh, pair of the shoe is thousand rupees so every shoe your agent sells for you you will pay him 100 rupees as commission so now just look at it doesn't this save you a lot of money it saved you money in the form of rent salary repairs maintenance housekeeping expenses so all this will result in a lot of savings for you in terms of uh, uh, you do not have any fixed cost incurred so your uh, whatever sales your agent does he sends you a statement at the end of the month and that much of commission you pay him or he, he deducts that commission from his collection and he remits the remaining money to you so this is a kind of an easy relationship but please remember when the agent is selling goods on your behalf you are principal and you are responsible for the agent's actions also so in case tomorrow agents uh, agent sell something defective goods to the to the customer and uh, the customer buys it in good faith then for that defective goods also you will be responsible so you need to be very sure about what what kind of a person you appoint as an agent of yours because the agent is merely representing you in your business and doing business transactions on your behalf he is not working as a principal and in return of which he is getting a commission okay so now like we like we read in the introduction some relationships are initiated when one party desires to extend his or her activities beyond his present limits beyond Delhi or capacity in modern life it would be virtually impossible for a business to function effect effectively without agents like I said there is a limit up to how much you can grow and expand on your own and then finally you reach a point where you will need to take help of some agents for example corporations must hire agents to work for them since a corporation is an artificial person a corporation means a company a company is an artificial person even though it has a legal identity and it is separate from its members it is not a natural person it cannot work without agents agency relationships occur frequently in the course of business and include hiring employees or retaining the services of other parties such as an attorney or a design professional so these are agents as well an agent has the potential to form contracts on behalf of the principal like I told you an agent does business on behalf of the principal and in doing so will bind the principal as a result the agency relationship is one of trust and confidence and an agent must perform his or her activities in a capable and consensuous manner that means he should be dedicated and sincerely do his activities because he is representing the principal's business so if there's any damage that takes place it is the principal's business that is damaged okay the law of agency is contained under sections 182 to 238 of the indian contracts act 1872 like i told you uh, the indian contracts act deals about every contract that happens and similarly even though there is a contract between the principal and an agent so that contract also between that is governed by the provisions of the Indian uh, Contracts Act 1872 and all the essential elements of a valid contract and need to be present in an agency contract as well that is there should be a valid offer and acceptance there should be valid consideration the law there should be a lawful object there should be free consent and uh, you know it should not be a explicitly void avoidable agreement if these uh, basic or essential qualities of a contract are present then uh, a con agency contract is said to be valid all right now in case you have any questions or anything please feel free to ask me let's proceed now we come to the understanding what is what is an agency the Indian Contracts Act 1872 does not define the word agency however the word agent is defined as a person employed to do any act for another person or to represent another in dealings with a third person the person for whom the act is done or so represented is called a principal please remember there is no employer employee relationship created in an agency relationship uh, there is a principal and agent relationship that is created and uh, the principal is a person whose business is being represented by the agent and whereas the agent it is his business to represent others and take a commission so the agent is not an employee of the principal okay so there is no so there is no employer employee relationship the agent is not supposed to or expected to act on the directions or orders of the principal but yes 
when it comes to representing his business there are certain things that the uh, principal will want want to be done a certain way and that will have to be done by the agent but he is not under the command or orders of the uh, principal all right so because he is he is a business owner in himself and for whatever service he is providing he is expecting a commission all right so test of agency now how do you test the agency that means whether a person has the capacity to bind the principal and make him answerable to a third party and whether he can establish privity of contract between the principal and third parties now what do you mean by this now we need to find out whether an agent really is fit or capable of being an agent now how what do you mean by this whether he is capable of being an agent so the our questions are whether the agent has the capacity to bind the principal and make him answerable to third parties like i told you a agent is a person who works on behalf of the principal and in case of any defaults or any activities of the agent it will be the principal that will be answerable you know the agent can obviously the agent agent will be answerable to the principal and it might be cut from his remuneration and other things but the loss in business or the loss of face happens for the principal the first question is whether a person who is being appointed as an agent is uh, has the capacity to bind the principal and make him answerable to third parties second question is whether he can establish privity of contract between the principal and parties the privity of contract means uh, establishes a relationship a legal obligation between the principal and third parties and always remember only a party to a contract can sue a stranger to a contract cannot sue to know more about this please do refer the indian contracts act 1872 session special class taken by me on the an academy learning app which will give you more insights into the essential elements of a uh, indian contracts act 1872 so now we need to answer these two questions if the answer to these questions is in the affirmative then there is a relationship of agency thus agency is a comprehensive word used to describe the relationship between one person and the other where it is where the first mentioned person brings the second mentioned person into the legal relation with others so it simply means wherever there is a relationship between the principal and agent such that the person has the capacity to bind the principal and make him answerable to third parties and he can establish a privity of contract between the principal and the third parties he is said to be an agent of the principal all right and so simply agency is a comprehensive word used when some person carries on the behalf of a business or behalf of someone else and has the capacity to uh, enter him or begin his legal relationship with others the rule of agency is based on the maxim qui facet per alium alium facet per se this is the latin word which means he who acts through an agent is acting through himself so the whole purpose of appointing a an agent what are the reasons to, to appoint a agent is to go to new geographies new products new customers for old products so a person always thinks about an agent for three reasons where is when he wants to enter new geographies for example bangalore the, the shoemaker in delhi he wanted to enter the bangalore market so he appointed an agent in bangalore or he he introduced a new product along with shoes he also started making jackets so he appointed an agent for sale of his jackets and maybe he wanted new customers in delhi itself maybe if he wants new customers that means the the people in the surrounding 2 or 4 kilometers used to come to his shop but he wanted to expand in delhi itself so new customers for old products so in these cases a person can appoint another person as an agent and an agent has the power to bind the principal to the third parties all right okay appointment and authority of agents now we are going to talk about the topic of how what is the uh, uh, procedure for appointment of agents and what is the authority of agents uh, who may employ an agent according to section 183 any person who is at the age of majority according to the law which he is subject and of uns and of sound mind may employ an agent thus a minor person or a person of unsound mind cannot appoint an agent so like we also saw in the topic on indian contracts act 1872 persons who are disqualified from entering into contracts are minors people of unsound mind and a person who has been declared as an insolvent by a competent court so these three people are disqualified from entering into contracts so similarly that same thing will apply here that any person who is a minor who is a, a person of unsound mind declared by a competent authority and who is a declared insolvent is it he declared insolvent 
by a competent authority cannot appoint an agent. Everyone else other than these can appoint an agent. Okay. Now, a uh, person qualified to appoint agent must be a major and he should be of sound mind like we discussed uh, previously. Who may be an agent? Section 184 provides that as between the principal and third persons, any person may become an agent, but no person who is not of the age of majority and of unsound mind can become an agent. So as to be responsible to his principal according to the provisions that we have contained therein. So like I told you, any person can be an agent between a principal and an agent, but a person who is of uh, minor age and a person who is of unsound mind cannot be the agent of another simply because they are in incompetent to enter into a contract. So any person who cannot enter into a contract as per the Indian Contracts Act 1872 cannot act as an agent of the principal. Uh, section 184 of the contract also provides that any person may become an agent. In other words, even a minor can become an agent and the principal can be bound by his act. Now, there are certain cases in which a minor can become the uh, become an agent and the principal can be bound by his acts. We will look at these points as we move on. All right. All right. Now, uh, we spoke about uh, appointment authority. Example, P appoints Q a minor to sell his car for not less than rupees 2,50,000. Q sells it for rupees 2 lakhs. P will be held bound by the transaction and further shall have no right against Q for claiming the compensation for having not obeyed the instructions since Q is a minor and the contract with a minor is void ab initio. That means, as the contract act says, a minor cannot enter into an agency contract if a person goes ahead and enters a contract with a minor. So, and if he incurs any loss due to that, he shall not be able to recover that loss from the minor because first place he should not have entered into a contract with the minor uh, as the contract is void ab initio. That means right from the beginning, the contract is void. Consideration not necessary. According to section 185, no consideration is necessary. To create an agency, the acceptance of the office of an agent is regarded as sufficient consideration for the appointment. Now, if we, if we go through the uh, Indian Contracts Act 1872, uh, one of the key essential elements of a valid contract are there should be a valid consideration. That means there should be no free transactions. So, free transactions are normally not valid contracts under the Indian Contracts Act 1872, subject to a few uh, exceptions. Like, for example, a contract made on... Uh, pure love and affection between family members, a uh, contract for a time bar debt, a contract for an agency relationship, a contract for a supply of necessities to a minor or a person incapable of contracting. So these were a few of the examples in which uh, consideration is not necessary. But barring these, every contract needs to have a consideration. Similarly, in the case of an agency relationship, when the principal goes in search for an agent and finally finds the agent, uh, does he pay him something as an advance or a thing no he just signs an agreement with him and says whatever you sell for me you take a commission out of it and the agent also says okay sir whatever i sell for you i will take a commission from that so in the case of an agency So, in case of an agency, the acceptance of office of an agent is sufficient consideration even though there is no consideration as such. So, this is also one of the exceptions to the rule that every contract should have a valid consideration because an agency contract really does not have a 
consideration and uh, the acceptance of office of the agent is only generally regarded as valid consideration all right now how do we create the agency the next topic that we're going to talk about now so far we talk, we spoke about the appointment and uh, uh, who is eligible to be an agent and uh, consideration now we think about how how an agency is created in the words of desai j of the supreme court of india the relationship of agency arises whenever one person called the agent has the authority to act on behalf of another person called the principal and consents to the act the relationship has genesis in a contract so a relationship of agency and uh, principal comes into existence whenever one person has the authority to act on behalf of another person and uh, the principal and the other person consents to this act then that's said to be a principal agency relationship that comes into existence okay the relationship of a principal and agent may be treated in any of the following ways the modes of creation of agencies so how is an agency principal agency relationship created is what we are going to discuss now what are the modes of creation of agency the various modes of creation of agency are by expressed appointment implied appointment necessity estoppel and ratification now express means when it's expressly said that a particular person is the is my agent then it is an express appointment when it is not said but the actions of the person make the other one feel or the action of a person give consent that some person is my agent then in that case it is known as implied appointment uh, and then it's necessary based on uh, the necessary or the situation certain agency relationships are created which we will talk about further estoppel by holding out is when a person uh, openly says that okay i am the agent of so and so person and uh, he allows the other person to believe that he is the agent uh, then it is an estoppel or agent by holding out and the agent by ratification is earlier who was not an agent but later on the principal uh, approves the the connect the relation or the connection or the existence of the agency relationship each of these points we are going to discuss in detail in the slides coming up now first one de def definitions of express and implied authority what do you mean by express and implied express authority and authority is said to be expressed when it is given by words spoken or written so today if i openly say that b is my agent or i enter into a contract with b and appoint b as my agent then that is an express authority or an express appointment that i have appointed b as an agent so this is also known as express appointment example a is residing in delhi and he has a house in kolkata a appoints b by a deed called the power of attorney as the caretaker of the house agency relationship is created by express agreement so a has a house in delhi and he lives in kolkata so obviously in uh, uh, delhi he has no one to take care of his house so he appoints b by a deed by a called the power of attorney as the caretaker of the house and so there is an agency relationship created between a and b by an express agreement let's take another example if a customer of a bank wishes to transact his business through an agent the bank will require written evidence of the appointment of the agent and will normally ask you to see the registered power of attorney um, appointing the agent so now see this example is an interesting example let's let's try it if any of you wants to try it they can try it uh, just try sending someone uh, and asking and sending someone to your bank and i'm sure all of us have a bank account a savings account so just try sending someone it could be even your brother sister your mother or your father and uh, tell them to just get a bank statement of yours on behalf of you okay the bank will not give it to you because they are not supposed to give it to you a bank statement is a very confidential document and uh, they will not give it to anyone else so the bank will immediately tell whoever you have sent that please get a letter from the person from the main account holder that you are authorized to collect the bank statement on on their behalf or you are their agent to whom i can give the bank statement so then the other person has to come back ask you for a letter and only when you give a letter stating that i so and so authorize so and so to collect the bank statement on my behalf and he shall be responsible for compliance and all the other signing of documents on my behalf and i shall i take equal responsibility for the same only if a letter like that is given will the bank share your bank statement with the person you sent be it your own family member so there there is an agency relationship that has been created
okay so then we come to implied authority now we saw explied authority express authority express authority is simply uh, an authority created by words uh, written or spoken uh, implied authority an authority is said to be implied when it is inferred from the circumstances of the case and things spoken or written or in the ordinary course of dealing may be accounted from the circumstance of the case so unlike an express contract now this is an this is an implied authority that means it is not openly told that okay so and so is my agent but the the actions between the two people between two people is assumed or it is concluded to be taken as a principal agency uh, relationship okay now let's take an example uh, if a person realize realizes rent and gives it to a landlord he in impliedly acts for the landlord as an agent now let's say uh, for all of us who are uh, uh, living in a rented house there so you know these days there is an electronic transfer provision also but there are a lot of places where the landlord comes every month to collect the rent so let's say a particular month he does not come but he sends his son to send to collect the landlord so there there is an implied authority to act as an agent even though the, the landlord does not need to give you a letter that uh, uh, so and so is coming please give the rent to him but please remember if in, it is it is equally or it is absolutely right for you to insist on a letter that uh, please give me a letter saying that I can give the rent to him tomorrow if he doesn't give the rent to the landlord you will still be responsible for that same so but if the action is so that you give the rent to the landlord's son and he gives it to the landlord and this happens time and time again from month to month to month time and time again then it can be assumed there is an implied authority for uh, the landlord's son to act as an agent of the landlord and collect the rent from you all right so here it is the case of implied appointment all right okay there is also one more example now uh, uh, a owns a shop in Salempur, living by living himself in Kolkata, and uh, visiting the shop occasionally. The shop is managed by B, and he is in the habit of ordering goods from C, in the name of A for the purpose. So that means uh, A has a shop in Salempur, and he lives in Kolkata. The shop of A is managed by B, and B has the habit of ordering goods from C, in the name of A for the purpose of the shop, and for paying for them out of A's funds. With A's knowledge. So the important point here is with A's knowledge. B has an implied authority from A to order goods from C in the name of A for the purpose. So here even though A has not given it expressly in writing that B is his agent, A knows that B is ordering goods from C in A's name and is also making payment to C from A's funds. And if A does not say anything, there he agrees. to the implied authority or agency okay so this is the meaning of implied authority or agency now the third one agency by estoppel an agency by estoppel is based on the principle of estoppel the principle of estoppel lays down that when one person by declaration or representation act or omission has intentionally caused or permitted another person to believe a thing to be true and to act upon such belief he shall not be allowed to deny his previous statements or he shall not be stopped to deny his previous statement of conduct the agency is implicit under section 237 of the indian contract act section 237 of the contract act says when an agent has without authority done acts or incurred obligations to third person on behalf of the principal the principal by is bound by such acts or obligation if he has by his words or conduct induce such third person to believe that such acts and obligations were within the scope of the agent's authority now see now now this is different from express and implied because see express says when it's written in words uh, written or spoken and implied says it is done by the actions now there might be certain there is also a third way in which an agency creation may be agency may be created which is known as agency by estoppel now in what happens in agency by estoppel um, this is when one person believes or makes someone else believe that so and so person is my agent and you can trust him even though he might not be his agent but then if that agent goes on and does any other any work beyond his authority then the first person cannot say no he is not my agent because he's made the other person believe that so and so person is my agent all right so now this can happen when now for example let's take the uh, 
let's take the rental uh, rental rental uh, this thing again let's say your landlord he comes every month to collect the rent but a few months he didn't come or he couldn't come because you know he fell he, he fell and broke his leg so he couldn't travel so in that case normally what happens the landlord might come to your house with his son and say from now on this gentleman will collect the rent and i will not be able to uh, come because i've injured my leg and it's hurting so i can't come so in this case it is an agency by estoppel so tomorrow when his son comes to collect the rent and you pay the rent to him and if his son runs away or does not give the money to him you shall not be responsible for it because this agency was created by estoppel that means the landlord made you believe or represented to you that his son is the agent even though he had no authority so then if the son does anything wrong you will not be responsible for that all right are you clear about this please take about a minute go through this and then we proceed All right. According to Section uh, 237 of the Contract Act, an agency by estoppel may be created when the following essentials are fulfilled. First one, the principal must have made a representation. The landlord makes a representation. The representation may be expressed or, employed, uh, or implied. So the landlord puts his hand around his shoulder, son's shoulder and says, uh, this guy will be my agent and from now on he will uh, collect the rent. So there has been an express uh, authority given. The, the representation must be the representation may state the agent has no authority to do certain act although he has no authority okay now the representation also will say that okay maybe he's a he's a small kid uh, the landlord's son but the landlord says my son will come and collect the rent from you but actually he does not have the authority because a minor cannot become an agent so so this has become a agency by estoppel the principal must have reduced the third person by such uh, I must have induced. So the third person is me, for example. So my landlord came and told me, yeah, my 15 year old son will be my agent henceforth and he will uh, take the rent on my behalf. So what has he done? Firstly, he has made a representation. The representation was expressed or implied and the representation must state that the agent has authority to do even though he has no authority. The principal must have induced the third person. So he made me believe that henceforth his son will come and collect the rent. The third person must have believed the representation and made the contract on the behalf of such representation so i am the third person so when his uh, son came next week next month to collect the rent i gave the rent because of the representation he has made now if his son loses the money on the way or he does not give it to his father or goes and spends that money with his friends i will not be responsible for the same because this agency was created under section 237 of, of the indian contracts act 1872 as an agency by estoppel or representation by the principal all right so let's look at an example a consigns goods to be for sale and gives him instructions not to sell below a fixed price uh, c being ignorant of b's instructions entered into a contract with b to buy the goods at a price lower than the reserve price a is bound by the contract a cannot plead that he had given instructions to b not to sell the goods below certain price an agency by estoppel is consequently deemed as an, deemed between a and b all right so in this case Firstly, A sends goods to B on consignment. Now, all of us know what is consignment. I have also taken a session on consignment accounts, uh, which is there as a special class on the Unacademy Learning app. I request you to go to that Unacademy Learning app and go through my special class on consignment accounts to understand what is consignment. Now, just to give you a gist of what is consignment, a consignment means it is on a... Uh, sale or approval basis for example if you sell goods to a person in uh, another state you're not selling it to him but you're sending it to him on consignment that means whenever he the other person in the state let's say b is in mumbai and you are in delhi so you send the goods from delhi to mumbai on consignment so and b receives it in mumbai right so he does not immediately send you the money as sale but there's an understanding that out of those goods whenever b makes a sale in uh, uh, mumbai he will deduct his expenses and whatever commission he has and then return the money to you in Delhi. So it is sort of an agency relationship where some, another person is selling goods on your behalf in another state. All right. So in this case, A consigns goods to B. So that means A appoints B 
as an agent for sale and gives him instructions not to sell below a fixed price. So A sends goods to B and tells him not to sell each shoe for less than 500 rupees. C being ignorant of B's instruction enters into a contract. So then B enters into a contract with C uh, to sell the shoes at a lower price at 400. Here, because it is an agency created by a stopple, okay, now uh, A has made C believe that B is his agent and B can enter into a contract on his behalf. C entered into a contract with B for a price lower than what A told him. Now B should have told him at that point, right, that no, I cannot sell it, but B did not say it. Even though it was B's mistake, A cannot plead that he had given B instructions not to sell the goods below the certain price. An agency of estoppel is created deemed between A and B. So in this present case, uh, even though A has incurred a loss, he cannot go back on the contract between B and C to be for the goods to be sold at below the cost at which uh, A told him. All right, he might take action against B and cut that money from his commission, but that is a different issue altogether. The contract between B and C will hold good, and A will have to uh, uh, deal or supply those shoes at a cost lower than what he had earlier decided. All right, please take about thirty seconds, go through this, and then we proceed. All right. Now, let's take another example. If Pierre was uh, the principal, has for several months permitted Sunil to buy goods on credit from Prasad and has paid for the goods brought by, bought by Sunil, Pierre cannot later refuse to pay Prasad who had supplied goods on credit to Sunil in the belief that he was Payal's agent and was buying the goods on behalf of Payal. Pierre. PL is stopped from now asserting that Sunil is not the agent because on earlier occasions he permitted Prasad to uh, believe that Sunil was his agent and Prasad had acted therefore. So, so let's take for example, we see in a lot of these shops, right? Uh, let's, if, if, let's say if we go to uh, 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 one second, consumer durable store. Okay, let's say we go to a consumer durable store, we go to, uh, let's say we go to a shop like uh, Giriyas or Pai or uh, Reliance Digital, okay, and we want to buy something. Now, there might be a case, see, this is a very hypothetical example I'm giving you. There might be something that you go and ask for a, a Samsung tablet. Or let's take, for example, you go to a, a road where there are a lot of mobile shops, okay, and you go and ask for the latest mobile from one shop, but that shop does not have that mobile. Now, obviously, he does not want to lose you as a customer. So what does he do? He immediately sends his boy, who might be the cleaning boy in the, in the shop, that uh, Chotu go and... Uh, uh, pick up the mobile from so and so shop i have spoken to them so he makes a call to another shop and he asks do you have this mobile with you now he's also a mobile shop, mobile phone dealer so he says yes i have please send your person so when this shopkeeper sends chotu to get the mobile in case chotu takes the mobile and runs away the shopkeeper will be responsible to pay the other shopkeeper for that mobile because in the previous past also uh, Chotu was sent a lot of times to get the mobile and the payment was made by the first shopkeeper to the second shopkeeper. So in this case, if Chotu runs away with the mobile, the first shopkeeper will be liable to the second shopkeeper because he made him believe by his actions and representations that Chotu is his um, agent. Alright, you're getting the point there? So this is said to be an agency. created by estoppel. Now, the next next uh, agency creation method is by necessity. An agency of necessity arises due to some emergent circumstances. In emergency, a person is authorized to do what he cannot ordinarily do, do in circumstances. Thus, when an agent is authorized to do certain act and while doing some, such an act, the emergency arises, he acquires an extraordinary or special authority to prevent his principle from loss. So, uh, in ordinary terms, uh, uh, necessity, an agency created by necessity simply means that a person normally does not have the power under the agency relationship, but under emergent or emergency situations, a person can get that extra authority to do work or to do tasks beyond his authority. Okay. 
So let's take let's take an example and understand this. Example: Raja has a large farm on which uh, Sham is the caretaker. Okay. Uh, when Raja is in Canada, there is a huge fire in the farm. Sham becomes the agent of necessity for Raja so as to save the property from being destroyed by fire. Raja, the principal, will be liable for the expenses. Sham is the agent of necessity incurred to put out the fire and save farm destruction during Raja's absence from the country. Now, let's look at this. Now, this is an agency created on necessity. Now, what does this mean? It simply means that a person does beyond his powers in certain emergent or emergency situations. So, let's say in this particular case itself, the owner of the farm is in Canada and Sham was the caretaker of the farm. Okay, so his, his job was just to take care of the farm and see that nothing, no one trespasses or no one comes and steals anything from there. So let's say there was a fire that took place in the farm. Now in this case, obviously Raja cannot do anything from Canada. He's too far away and this farm is in India. So in this case, when Sham has the necessity authority or the authority by necessity in order to do acts by which the loss of the principle is minimized. Okay, and for this he may call the fire brigade, he may call people, he may... Uh, ask help to come and douse the fire and whatever and whatever expenses he incurs for that it will be paid by the by principal and not by the caretaker so this is an agency relationship created under emergency. Now he might just be a caretaker, he might be a security guard in the farm. But when the fire took place, he immediately had to act so that his boss, boss's uh, um, loss is minimized. So for that, he immediately called the fire brigade, called people for help, put and douse the fire and he might have incurred certain expenditures. That expenditure will be incurred by the principal himself. Because as a security guard, he can always say, yeah, I was a security guard and I was not allowing anyone, but uh, the fire took place, so what could I do? No, but instead he went ahead and took the role of the principal in order to minimize his loss. So this is known as a, a agency by necessity. Take about 30 seconds. Okay, now, now then the fifth one we have is an agency by ratification. Like I told you, ratification means approval of an act that was done previously when there was no authority, but later on it was ratified or approved by the principal. Rights of a person to act, rights of a person as to acts done for him without his authority. Effect of ratification, section 196, where there are, where acts are done by one person on behalf of another, but without his knowledge or authority. He may elect to ratify or to disown such acts. If he ratifies them, the same efforts effects will follow as if they had been performed by his authority. In simple words, ratification means approving a previous act or transaction. Now, sim now simply in this, now let's take the previous example in which Ram and Sham. All right, now Ram, Ram is the owner of the farm and he's sitting in Canada and Sham is the security guard. Okay, so their fire fire broke out in the farm and uh, Sham thought, okay, it's my boss's factory and this thing, farm, so let me just uh, uh, douse the fire and minimize the loss. So for this, he did whatever he could. He called the fire brigade, he called people for help, he, he tried, he got water tanks and everything and he doused the fire and he minimized the loss of his boss. Now, even though he was not supposed to do so, he was just a security guard, okay, he's being paid to act as a security guard, he didn't have to do this. But he went ahead and did it and that was an agency created by necessity. Now, when his boss, let's say he did not inform his boss. Now, when his boss comes back from Canada the next week, uh, he gets to know that a fire had taken place and uh, Sham has incurred rupees 5,000 to douse the fire. So, in that place, the boss has two choices. Either he can ratify the actions of Sham or he can say, no, I don't, I don't agree to it and I will not pay you. Now, obviously, if he tells Sham that I will not pay you, there's nothing much Sham can do and Sham can just quit the job. Okay, but in good faith, when he's done something, it is his moral duty of his boss to actually come and tell him, okay, Sham, you've done it, no problem. I accept it or I ratify it. And once he ratifies it, then that action becomes as if he had the authority. Then the principal will reimburse him and uh, pay him the money. All right. Now, let's take the example here. Example, X, who is wise agent, has on 10th January 2019 purchased goods from Z on credit without wise 
permission so x and x is the x he is the agent of y and 10th january purchases goods on credit from z without y's permission after the purchases on may on 20th january y tells x that he will accept responsibility uh, to pay for the purchases although at the time of purchase the agent had no authority to buy or buy the things on credit x's subsequent statement on 20th january 2019 amounts to a ratification of the agent's purchase of goods on 10th january so even though the agent bought goods which he had no authority to buy on credit later on when the principal got to know about this he ratified the action of the agent and made it good so this is what you mean by agency by ratification uh, please take about 30 seconds go through this and then we proceed okay essentials of a valid ratification now we just understood what a ratification means now let's look at an essentials of a valid ratification um, ratification may be expressed or implied a ratification may be expressed or may be implied implied in the conduct of the person on whose behalf acts are done just like how an agency can be expressed or implied the ratification can also be expressed or implied let's say uh, x in the previous example bought goods on credit even though he had no authority so what what did y do now when when z comes for payment y either can put his hands around x and say yes he's my agent and whatever he did is okay or he can simply take out the money and give it to z when he when he openly tells z that he's my agent that time he's expressly ratifying it and when he just takes out the money and gives it to z he is impliedly uh, ratifying that okay he was my agent i'm responsible for whatever uh, i uh, whatever he has purchased but he might also say that next time if z, if, uh, z come if x comes and asks you for purchase on credit please call me once and ask me all right i will not pay this every time so he can say that as well so that is the express or implied let's take an example uh, a without authority buys goods for b after b sells goods to c on his own account b's conduct implies a ratification of the purchase made by him for that so uh, firstly a without authority goes ahead and buys goods for b so let's take the mobile example again uh, chotu goes to a, the nearby shop and picks up a mobile on behalf of b he comes and gives the mobile to B. Now, what does B do? B can either fire him and say, why, who the hell asked you to uh, get the mobile? Please go and return the mobile and come and don't do it next time. Or if suddenly a, a, a customer walks in and asks for that same mobile, and that is a mobile in which you get a good margin, B might sell that mobile to C, okay, without saying anything to A. Now, there it is an implied ratification of A's action. That means B has accepted his action and he's gone on and sold the good to the customer let's take the second example uh, a without b's authority lends money lends b's money to c afterwards b accepts interest on the money from c b's conduct implies a ratification of the loan so let's say in again in that case a has taken b's money and given it to c so when b got to know about this b could have fired c and asked him who asked you to pay the money he could have gone to c and got the money back but he didn't do anything when c came to his house and later gave him the interest for that money B instead of saying anything just accepts the interest in that case it is an implied ratification of the action of A okay then the, the, the next essentials of a valid ratification is knowledge requisite for valid ratification no valid ratification can be made by a person whose knowledge of the facts of the case is materially defective so basically it's 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 very logical that any person who does not know about the act that Chotu has gone and taken the mobile from another shop and given it to him if he does not even know about it how will he ratify it so the knowledge about the action which is done by someone beyond his authority should be known by a person uh, who is about to ratify a particular thing all right for example a has the authority from p to buy certain goods at market rate so basically a authorizes p to buy certain goods from market rate p buys at a higher rate but p accepts the purchase after p afterwards p comes to know that the goods purchased by a for p belong to a himself the ratification is not binding on himself okay, on on p okay so here the question is no valid ratification can be made by a person who whose knowledge of the facts of the case is defective that means he should know the material facts so in this particular case a authorized p to buy certain goods from the market at the market rate 
So P went and bought the goods at a higher rate from the power market and P accepted that purchase. Afterwards, uh, afterwards uh, P comes to know that the goods purchased by A for, for, for P belong to A himself. The ratification is not binding because these goods what he purchased itself are wrong. Those were goods belonging to A himself. How can he, how can P purchase goods belonging to A from A, it's for A itself. So in that case, the entire transaction is not binding and it is an invalid transaction. Please take about 30 seconds, go through this and then we proceed. Okay, now the third essential uh, characteristics of a ratification, effect of ratifying unauthorized act forming part of the transaction. A person ratifying any unauthorized act done on his behalf ratifies the whole of the transaction of which such an act be formed. Uh, there can be a ratification of an act entirely or its rejection in entirety. The principal cannot ratify a part of the transaction which is beneficial to him and reject the rest. Okay, so that means you either ratify the full thing or you reject the full thing. You cannot choose what to ratify and what to reject. Now, let's take an example. Now, um, Chotu from the mobile shop uh, opens the drawer of the boss, okay, and steals money and goes to a neighboring mobile shop and pays for that mobile and uh, takes the mobile for his boss. Now, he's not stealing it, but he brings it He and he hands it over to the boss. Now, when the boss sells that good to see or he comes to know that Chotu has stolen the uh, money from his drawer and then got and bought, gone and bought the goods. If he agrees to that and goes ahead and sells the good to see without saying anything to Chotu, that means he is ratifying the entire transaction. Okay. He cannot say that no, what you did in the stealing the money and this thing was wrong, but yeah, good thing you went and bought the mobile end game because see, I sold it and I made a profit. You cannot do that. So the minute he is ratifying or he sells the goods to someone else, the mobile phone, he is ratifying the entire transaction and he cannot uh, selectively reject something and claim something. Okay. So then in that case, he's also accepting that yeah, next time onwards, uh, Chotu, if you want, you can take the money from my drawer and go and buy the mobile income. So that's his choice if he wants to ratify the whole thing or he does not want to ratify the whole thing. Okay. Then the fourth characteristic of a, of a valid rat ratification is ratification of unauthorized act cannot injure a third person. An act done by one person on behalf of another without such other person's authority, which if done with authority would have the effect of subjecting a third person to damages or terminating any right or interest of the third person cannot by ratification be made to have such effect. In other words, when the interest of third party is affected, the principle of ratification does not apply. Ratification cannot relate back to the date of the contract if third party has an intervening time acquiring rights. Okay, so now let's take an example. A not being authorized thereby by B demands on behalf of B the delivery of a chattel, the property of B from C who is in possession of it. The demand cannot be ratified by B so as to make C liable for damages for his refusal to deliver. Okay, so wherever there is any uh, relationship or damages being created to a third party by the unauthorized act of another person, then such an act cannot be ratified by the person on behalf of whom the act has been done. All right. So in this case, let's let's read the example again. A not being authorized thereby, thereto by B demands on behalf of B the delivery of a chattel, the property of B from C who is in possession of it. So basically C had a chattel which belonged to B. So A did not, uh, B did not authorize A to go and ask C for that chattel, but A still went and ahead and asked the chattel from B. This dem demand cannot be ratified by B so as to make uh, C liable for damages for his refusal. First and foremost, uh, A had no authority to do that. And because A had no authority to do that, uh, B cannot ratify this because obviously C did not give him the chattel, right? Uh, just, just, just hold on one second.
Sorry, I had to uh, I had to go for the water. All right. So if the if there is an unauthorized act on any person and uh, uh, it is creating a damage or compensation for an unknown party, then that act cannot be ratified by the person on whose behalf it was done. All right. Then let's take another example. A holds a lease from B, terminable on three months' notice to C, an unauthorized person. Uh, gives notice gives uh, an unauthorized person gives notice of termination to A. The notice cannot be ratified by B so as to binding on A. So the contract was between A and B. An unauthorized person gives a termination notice to uh, A. Okay, that uh, please vacate the place or else there will be a penalty. Now such an act cannot be ratified by B. Okay, which creates a damage or a compensation on another person. The fifth essential quality of uh, uh, a valid ratification are the ratification should be within a reasonable time. Ratification must be made within a reasonable period of time. If there is any unauthorized act done by person on behalf of another person today, you cannot ratify it after a year. It has to be done within reasonable time so that the people involved in the contract know the rights and obligations of each person. All right. Now, communication of ratification, the ratification must be communicated to the other party. So in case there is any per person who does an unauthorized act on behalf of one person, uh, so the person on whom the act was done must be known, must be communicated about such ratification that, okay, this person uh, had, who had come to you and asked you for this, he was my person only and I only had sent him. So then that is a ratification and that needs to be communicated to the other party. Uh, act to be ratified must be valid an act to be ratified should be should not be void or illegal for example payment of dividend out of capital is void and cannot be ratified so whatever the act the unauthorized person has done should be uh, valid and legal it should not be void or illegal in case it is void or illegal then there can be no ratification for the same all right so these are the points or these are the characteristics of a of essentials of a valid ratification I request you to go through this, take a minute and then we proceed. Like I said, I have taken full-fledged sessions on Indian Contracts Act 1872 as special class on the Unacademy uh, Learning App. I request uh, all of you to go through, go, to the, go through the session on the Unacademy Learning App as a special class and there are various other special classes taken there too, uh, which will help you in your preparation for the CA Foundation and Intermediate Examinations. Please go through them and um, let me know in case you have any questions or a feedback and I will be taking a lot more uh, special classes this Sunday which will help you definitely help you in your preparation for the CA foundation and intermediate examination. So please be there and uh, I hope you benefit from the same. Now the extent of agent's authority. We look at the next topic uh, as to to what extent is an agent uh, authorized to do something. The authority of an agent means his capacity to bind the principal to third parties. That means how much of authority has the principal given to an agent to bind the principal in front of the third parties. The agent can bind the principal only if he acts within the scope of his authority. The extent of an agent's authority, whether expressed or implied, is determined by. So please note that whatever authority the principal has given to the agent, an agent can, act, can bind the principal only to that authority. He cannot bind it more than that. Now, let's say if a person appoints, uh, if A appoints B as his agent to look for customers, not to buy or sell, not to get into a buying or selling agreement, to look for customers and bring the customers to A. All right. So now A's, uh, B's authority is just to look for customers and tell them, sir, please come. I will introduce you to my boss. You can please strike a deal and uh, whatever best deal you get, you please take it from there. He cannot sell or decide on the price of something. So if he sells or decides on the price of something, he is said to be acting 
beyond his authority and that particular transaction is invalid okay now the extent of an agent's authority whether express or implied is determined by the nature of the act of or the business he is appointed to do things which are incidental of to the business or are usually done in the course of such business the usage of trade or business so basically what authority is given to a agent is determined by the nature of the act or the business he is appointed to do like i told you he is appointed to just look for customers and not sell the goods to him then that is his scope of authority things which are incidental to the business or are usually done in the course of such business so uh, basically if there are any activities incidental to the main authority even he is authorized to do that for let's say for example if i have authorized him to look for customers and bring them to me then he is authorized to make phone calls on my behalf or he is he is authorized to issue pamphlets on my behalf in order to get the customers to me all right so those are incidental matters subject to the main authority and usage of trade or business so so normally if in the trade or business there are other activities that are done normally those will also form within his scope of authority now example of this could be uh giving the prospective customers the visiting card of mine okay calling them up visiting and meeting them and giving the visiting card and saying please go and talk to him please meet him he will give you a good deal that is also an uh, act that is due to the usage of trade or business and that is why that will be allowed as well okay whatever be the nature of the extent of the agent's authority it will always include the authority to do the following so whatever might be the authority as discussed between the agent and principal but it will always include the authority to do the following acts that means an agent will always be authorized to do the following acts which are which may be mentioned or may not be mentioned first one every lawful thing necessary for purpose of carrying it out now the agent will be authorized to do anything lawful for the purpose of carrying out the end objective like for example if i have told him that please bring me customers in that case whatever lawful activity he can do to bring me customers he will do that now that could be making phone calls to them visiting them uh, trying to convince them uh, giving them giving them about the details of mine showing them my catalog or showing them the product samples whatever lawful he is authorized to do that as well the only thing i told him not to do is not to sell the final goods to him and not to decide on the price so we are beyond that whatever is lawful for the purpose of bringing the customer to me the agent can do next one every lawful thing justified by various customs of trade so if there is any activity which is justified by normal trade usage he is authorized to do that also and that could also mean uh calling up uh calling up another uh, a third party to get the numbers of customers or the people in that area who are who, who have other shoe shops so he can do all those activities also and in case of an emergency all such acts for the purpose of protecting the principal from loss as will be done by a person of ordinary prudence in his own case under certain circumstances so in case where the agent finds out that the principal might incur some losses or he is in danger and in the emergency case if he does something to Uh, reduce the losses or avoid the losses to the principal then he will be authorized to do those acts in a state of emergency as well all right please take about 30 seconds go through this and then we proceed okay uh, the agent's authority is governed by two principles namely in normal circumstances and in emergency so whatever authority is given to an agent it can only be in two situations right what is the normal authority given to him and what is the authority he has in, in case of an emergency so let's discuss that an agent's authority or the extent of an agent's authority in normal circumstances okay in uh, normal circumstances an agent having an authority to do an act has authority to do everything lawful which is necessary in order to do that act okay so if uh, the normal authority that a person has an agent has he has the authority to do every lawful thing which is necessary to do the end act if i tell him to go and sell the shoes and take a commission of 10% then he has the authority to do every lawful thing in order to sell that shoes now what are the things he could do he could call up customers he could make cold calls he could take samples and go to factories he could go and samples and stand outside it companies he could go to busy roads and stand there and um, and talk to people and show them the samples so whatever is lawful 
in order to make a sale he is authorized to do all that tomorrow i cannot tell him no 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 i didn't ask you to go and stand in front of the it company i didn't ask you to go and uh, make phone calls he will say it's lawful and if i need to make sales and get a commission i'm doing that but he is not authorized to do any unlawful or illegal thing an agent having an authority to carry on a business has authority to do every lawful thing necessary for the purpose usually done in the course of conducting such business so if is if the agent's business is to sell shoes and take a commission he can do anything lawfully for the purpose of selling the shoes and taking the commission from me okay but he cannot do any Ill illegal or unlawful things let's take the first example a is employed by b residing in london so b resides in london to recover at mumbai a debt due to b so some person had money to pay to b b is in london okay but uh, a is in mumbai so b appoints uh, a in mumbai a may adopt any legal process necessary for the purpose of recovering the debt and may give a valid discharge for the same so so now in this case b can use any legal means to go and recover the debt that, that could be uh, call the police uh, call the person who owns the who owes the money to b uh, go to his house and meet him explain things to him show documents to him and do all that so whatever is legal for recovering b's money in mumbai a can do that but he cannot resort to any illegal or unlawful activities like beating him up or uh, threatening him or injuring him or kidnapping his family he cannot do anything like that only only lawful and legal activities can be carried out by the agent let's take the second example a constitutes b as his agent so a has appointed b as his agent to carry on his business of a shipbuilder so a carries on the business of shipbuilder a appoints b to carry on the business of a shipbuilder b may purchase timber and other materials and hire workmen for the purpose of carrying on the business so for the purpose of business of shipbuilding b has the authority to buy timber and other materials and hire men for the purpose of carrying the business so those acts are all lawful and legal so tomorrow a cannot say no no i told you i gave you the authority to build the ship but how did you go and buy timber how did you hire people so obviously b will say without buying timber and without hiring people how can i build a ship so it is assumed that along with the authority of building a ship he also has the authority to buy material and hire workmen for carrying on the business there should be no illegal or unlawful activities are we clear all right please go through this then now we look at an agent's authority in an emergency an agent has authority in an emergency to do all such acts for the purpose of protecting the principal from loss as would be done by a normal person so basically a person in an emergency has additional authority to do all the acts that will avoid or minimize the loss that could uh, occur to the principal and uh, the agent will be expected to behave in an ordinary prudent manner as if it's, it was his own property that was being endangered or it was the own loss that he was going to face so to constitute a, a valid agency in an emergency the following conditions must be satisfied agent should not be in a position or have any opportunity to communicate with the principal in the time available so the first case now first thing we saw the what is the authority of the agent in case in the normal time then we see what is the authority of the agent in an emergency so the first condition for a person to exercise authority under emergency is he should not be able to communicate with the principal within the time available so let's say uh, the security guard of a factory of a farm is there in mumbai and his boss is in canada so the fire broke out now he's trying to contact his boss but in canada it's night time his boss has kept his phone on silent and he's sleeping so he is not able to communicate with his boss in canada the second one there should have been actual and definite commercial necessity for the agent to act promptly now the security guard who is there now obviously uh, or the agent who is there he he has to act right either he can just stand there and watch the the farm from catching fire and destroying everything and say in the end of it say no no sir my job was to sell so i was just selling no what for me your farm house sold your farm house was uh, burnt so there should be an actual necessity so if it's caught fire it is an emergency it's a commercial necessity and he needs to stop it to in order to reduce the losses okay then the third one the agent should have acted bona fide and for the benefit of the principal here the the agent should not look at any undue advantage of his 
okay that oh let me put a setting with the the other person and call them and then i'll take money from the principal no it should be purely in the interest of the principal that the principal's losses should be avoided or minimized uh, the agent should have adopted the most reasonable and practicable course under the circumstances that means whatever a reasonable man of common sense would have done in that situation the agent would be expected to do that uh, like call the fire brigade call people for help call for water and whatever are the expenses incurred for that he will get a reimbursement but he should not look for to to try to fancy that oh let me call a helicopter or let me call something else or let me do this whatever a man of normal common sense would dis decide to do the agent should do that and lastly the agent must have been in possession of the goods belonging to his agent and which are subject matter of contract now the agent has the farm of uh, the principal and that is the subject matter of the contract that whatever sales you make you take a commission so the farm or the product of the principal is in possession of the agent and then it becomes the agent's moral responsibility to uh, do more than his authority in case of an emergency now well, let's take the first example an agent for sale may have goods repaired if it is necessary so uh, certain items are being given to an agent to sell it and suddenly the agent realizes that out of the 10 items one is uh, spoiled so then he has the authority to get it repaired and sell it and obviously whatever the repair repair costs for that product he will reimburse it from the uh, principal okay example 2 a consigns provisions to b in kolkata with directions to send them immediately to c at katak b may send provisions make may send the provisions at kolkata if they not bear the if they are they will not bear the journey to to katak without spoiling so basically a hires a person b as an agent in kolkata and then sends goods to b which goods are sent to supposed to be sent to C in Katak. So B has the authority if he finds out that in case he sends those goods to Katak by, by road, the goods will get spoiled before it reaches Katak. So he might send it back to A and tell him that no, if I send it there, it will get spoiled. Please, I'm sending it back. Keep it safe and we will use it later to sell it to someone else. All right. Uh, in the meantime, take about a minute, go through this and then we proceed. Now we come to the topic on sub agents. Okay, now we spoke about agents and principals. Now let's talk about sub agents. When an agent cannot delegate, an agent cannot lawfully employ another to perform acts which he has expressly or impliedly undertaken to perform personally, unless by ordinary custom of trade a sub agent may, or from the nature of the agency, a sub agent must be employed. Now, if I employ B, to sell shoes of mine in the state of Mumbai, then normally it is not allowed for B to appoint another sub agent in uh, uh, Mumbai to sell the goods in Mumbai. He has to do it because my express contract is with him, it's not with the sub agent. But this is subject to the condition that normally in that trade, this should not be allowed. If it is allowed in the normal trade usage and the parlance, then it is allowed, otherwise, no. So, most of the cases, sub agents are not allowed. Okay, now sub agents. Sub agent is a person employed by and acting under the control of the original agent in the business of the agency. So A appoints B as his agent and B further appoints C as his agent. So uh, A's contract is with B and B further goes on and appoints C as his agent. So in this case, C becomes the sub agent of A and B becomes the agent of A, even though there is no agreement or contract between A and C. And this kind of arrangement is normally not allowed and it is also not binding on A. Any action of B is binding on A, but action of C is not binding on A unless A ratifies or agrees to the same. Okay. Analysis. Sub agency refers to a case where the agent appoints another agent. B appoints C. The appointment of sub agent is not lawful because the agent is a delegatee and a delegatee cannot further delegate. This is the this is based on the Latin principle delegatus non protest, non protest delegate. It simply means a person who himself is a delegatee cannot further delegate. So normally sub uh, 
sub agency arrangements are not allowed okay so and anyway a will not be responsible for the actions of c as only b will be responsible for that all right now a contract of agency is a fiduciary character it is based on the confidence reposed by the principal in the agent and that's why a delegatee cannot further a delegate now see when i meet a person let's say i want to buy my i want to sell my shoes from bangalore i want to sell it in mumbai now in this case obviously i will go and meet the agent or i will talk to the agent and maybe and maybe he's an expert guy so uh, i might appoint him as my agent that okay you seem to be well versed in mumbai you know the business well you are an experienced guy so please uh, enter into a contract with me and uh, uh, you sell my shoes and whatever i whatever sales you make 10% of that keep it as a commission now obviously i am reposing my trust in my agent a okay and if he further goes and uh, appoints another sub agent then he is basically breaking my trust because i do not know the sub agent i know the agent and my contract is with the agent so if he further goes and tells he hires someone else to go and sell my shoes that is not legally allowed okay and in case he's done that he should tell me about it in case he doesn't tell me then it becomes a voidable contract or at least i am not bound by it okay now here are the exceptions where an agent can appoint a sub agent the appointment of a sub agent would be valid if terms of the appointment originally contemplated it so let's say i appointed an agent in Mum agent a in mumbai for selling my shoes in mumbai so when uh, when i made the contract with the agent a in mumbai he told me that sir this business i know a lot of people a lot of other smaller agents and uh, this is the way it works you know he, i know people who can get into the corners of mumbai and sell your shoes so please leave it to me but i should be allowed to sub agent sub agency creation shoes so in that case if i have accepted it in the original agreement in that case it is valid otherwise no the second case uh sometimes custom of the trade may provide for appointment of sub agents in both these cases the sub agent would be treated as the agent of the principal also now in certain cases the trade or the business itself requires that you you appoint sub agents so in that case even if it is not expressly given in the agreement but then the agent would be allowed to hire sub agents and the agent sub agent would be treated as the agent of the principal so in case number 1 and case number 2 the sub agent is treated as agent of principal okay now the third case where in the course of agent's employment unforeseen emergency arise which make it necessary for him to delegate authority so in emergency situations a appoints now normally a appoints b as agent b meets with an accident and is immobile and cannot go into the lanes of mumbai and sell his shoes in this case b can appoint c as sub agent and this information should be given to a okay info should be given to a all right all right please take about a minute go through this and then we proceed okay now we 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 analyze that point where the sub agent is properly appointed where a sub agent is properly appointed the principal is bound by the acts and therefore responsible to the third parties if he were an agent originally appointed so in case the principal agent uh, principal gets into a contract with the agent and allows him to appoint a sub agent in that case the principal will be bound by the activities of the sub agent okay let's take an example a a carrier agreed to carry 60 bags of cotton waste from morvi to bhavnagar by a truck 
A asked B, another truck to carry the goods. The goods were damaged in transit, hence A was liable even though it was proved that B was the carrier. Okay, now in, the, in this case A sublet it or sub, sub agency uh, gave it to a sub agent. In this case A will be liable for the damages. Okay, now uh, in case of appointment without agency, now in case a sub agent has been hired or appointed without agency, without authority, what happens? Uh, in case where the appointment of sub agent takes place without authority, the principal is not bound by the acts of the sub agent and the sub agent is not bound to the principal. Obviously, na, if the principal has not appointed or not approved the appointment of sub agent, then the principal is not bound by the acts of the sub agent and the sub agent is not bound or answerable to the principal. Uh, where the sub agent purportly acts in the name of his first principal. The first principal may ratify the act of the sub agent. However, if the sub agent acts in his own name or in the name of the agent who has without authority delegated it to the sub agent, the business which is in fact of the principal, the principal cannot ratify. Now, let's take for example, uh, uh, if the principal knows about the appointment of the sub agent and there is any act done by the sub agent beyond the powers, in that case, the principal can ratify it. He can say, yeah, I know about it. I, I got it, got him to do it. So it's okay. But in case the sub agent has been uh, appointed beyond the authority or, or the principal had not given the authority to the agent to appoint a sub agent, then in that case, the act of the sub agent cannot be ratified. All right, please take about a minute, go through this and then we proceed. Now, what is a sub? Now we spoke about an agent. We spoke about a sub agent. Now we look at another concept called a substituted agent. All right, substituted agent is a person appointed by the agent to act for the principal in the business of agency with the knowledge and consent of the principal. So in this case, uh, a sub a substituted agent is an agent appointed by the agent of a principal to carry on the business of agency. That too, with the knowledge of the principal. Substituted agents are not sub agents. They are not sub agents, but they are basically uh, sub agents. Uh, sub agents. Just one sec. Just hold on. Just one second. All right, so this is not a sub agent, but it is a agent is the person who who acts on uh, in place of the main agent who is appointed and maybe the agent is not able to do something due to an emergency. Where the principal agent, where the principal appoints an agent and if that agent identifies another person to carry out acts ordered by the principal, then the second person is not to be treated as a sub agent, but only as a pure agent of the original principal. So let's say the principal appoints A as his agent and uh, A appoints B as the person who is supposed to be the agent of the principal. In that case, he is not supposed to be a sub agent, but is supposed to be the agent of the original principal as a substitute principal, substituted principal. A uh, relationship between principal and persons duly appointed by agent to act in the business of agency. Now, where an agent holding an express or implied authority to name another person to act for the principal in the business of the agency has named another person accordingly, such person is not a sub agent, but an agent of the principal for such part of the business of the agency and is entrusted to him. So this should be the normal understanding between the principal and an agent that if the principal gives the right to the agent to appoint another person as the agent in behalf of the original agent, then he will be the substituted agent and he will be allowed to do so. Please take about a minute, go through this and then we proceed.
Okay, let's proceed. Example, let's look at the example. Example 1, A directs B, his solicitor, to, to sell his estate by auction and to employ an auctioneer for the purpose. B names C, an auctioneer, to conduct the sale. C is not the sub-agent but A's agent for the conduct of the sale. So A directs, A tells B that please go and look for an auctioneer, you know, to sell my uh, estate. So what B does, B uh, goes and employs an auctioneer. An auctioneer is a person who conducts an auction. So then B, C becomes a direct agent of uh, A and not a sub-agent of A. Let's take the second example. A authorizes B, a merchant in Kolkata, to recover the monies due to A from C. Alright, so A authorizes B in Kolkata to recover the monies due from A to A from C and Co. Now C and Co owed some money to A in Kolkata. So A appoints B in merchant in Kolkata to recover the monies due to A from C and Co. B instructs D, a solicitor, to take legal proceedings against C and Co for the recovery of the money. Now D is not a sub-agent but is a solicitor for A. Now what happened, A has A was supposed to get some money from C and Co in Kolkata. So for that, for recovering that money, A appoints B and tells him, please recover my money. So in the earlier slides, we saw that uh, an agent is allowed to do all the legal things, the lawful things for the purpose of the end objective for which he has been appointed. So in this case, uh, in this case, B goes on and looks for and goes and appoints a legal uh, consultant to, to for the recovery of money. Now D is not a sub-agent but a solicitor for A. So D becomes a direct agent of A and not a sub-agent of A. Agent's duty in naming such person. In selecting such agent for his principal, an agent is not bound is bound to exercise the same amount of discretion as a man of ordinary prudence would in his own case and if he does not, he is not responsible to the principal for the acts or negligence of the agent so selected. Alright, so whenever an agent appoints another person as an agent of the principal, he should do it keeping in mind or assuming that it is his own transaction and uh, in case something goes wrong, he would incur a loss and if he does it with common sense and what a man of ordinary prudence would exercise in his own case, then he will not be responsible for the acts or negligence so selected. So this simply means if the agent appoints another, another person as the agent of the principal knowing very well that that person is not good in his job, he incurs a lot of losses, he is not a person who can be trusted, he is a fraud. In that case, if the agent's actions causes any damage or loss to the principal, the original agent will be responsible for the same. Alright, please take about 30 seconds, go through this and then we proceed. Okay, analysis. While selecting a substituted agent, substituted agent, an agent is bound to exercise same amount of diligence as a man of ordinary prudence would and if he does so, he will not be responsible for the acts of negligence. Now, let's say the substituted agent does something wrong or some willfully something wrong due to which there is a loss incurred to the principal. Now, if the agent had selected this sub-agent, keeping in mind everything and exercising normal prudence, what a normal person would do for his own business, then in that case he will not be responsible for the acts or negligence of the substituted agent. But if he does it with any other ulterior motive, then he will be responsible for the acts of negligence of the substituted agent. Let's look at an example. A instructs B, a merchant, to buy a ship for him. B employs a ship surveyor of good reputation to choose a ship for A. Okay, so now A has uh, appointed B as his agent. Now for the purpose of selecting the ship, B employs a ship surveyor of good reputation to choose a ship for A. Now ship surveyors are people who look at the quality of the ship, survey it and say whether it's fit to be purchased or not. The surveyor makes the choice negligently and the ship turns out to be an unseaworthy and is lost. So uh, the surveyor goes on and makes a very negligent and careless decision and uh, because of which the ship turns out to be of bad quality and is lost. Here in this case B is not but the surveyor is responsible to A. Now why is this? Because 
B was a person of good reputation and he was known to always select a good ship but in this case he was negligent. So what B did was what a man of ordinary prudence would do. He employed a good surveyor, a ship surveyor of a good reputation. Now if he made the, the surveyor made a mistake, B cannot be held responsible for the same but the surveyor is responsible to A. Okay, let's look at the second example. Uh, a consigns goods to B. A merchant for sale in due course employs another auctioneer in good credit to sell the goods of A and allows the auctioneer to receive the proceeds of the sale. The auctioneer afterwards become insolvent and without having accounted for the sale proceeds. B is not responsible to A for the sale proceeds. So basically again A appoints B as an agent and tells him to please sell his goods. Now B for the purpose of this for the sale of goods appoints an auctioneer C who is also supposed to be in good reputation. So C conducts the auction, takes the goods, conducts the auctions, collects the sales money. But before he could give that money to A, he goes bankrupt, the, the auctioneer. Now in this case, because B exercised normal prudence, uh, B will not be responsible and the auctioneer will be responsible. Okay, please take about a minute, go through this and then we proceed. Okay, now uh, this is an important slide. Let's look at the difference between a sub-agent and a substituted agent in detail. Alright, let's look at this. Uh, first column is serial number, then we have sub-agent and then we have substituted agent. So let's look at the differences slowly. Now the first difference, a sub-agent does his work under the control and directions of the agent. A substituted agent works under the instructions of the principal. So like I said, like we discussed earlier, a sub-agent is an agent appointed by the uh, agent. So he comes under the control and supervisions of the agent whereas a substituted agent works under the instructions of the principal. A substituted agent is an agent appointed by the main agent to work in his place and with the knowledge of the principal. So a substituted agent works under the instructions of the principal. Uh, the agent not only appoints a sub-agent but also delegates to him a part of his own duties. The agent does not delegate any part of his task to a substituted agent. So now what happens in a sub-agency relationship when an agent appoints an agent as a sub-agent, he also delegates a part of his duties and job to the sub-agent. But when, a, when an agent appoints another agent, a substituted agent, he does not delegate any part of his authority to the substituted agent and the substituted agent becomes directly answerable to the principal. Okay. There is no privity of contract between the principal and agent. Privity of contract is established between the principal and the substituted agent. Now privity of contract means the relationship, a legal relationship. In a case of a sub-agency, uh, there is no creation of legal relationship between the sub-agent and the principal unless the principal knows about it and ratifies the same. But in the case of a substituted agent, there, there is a legal relationship that is created between the principal and the substituted agent. Uh, the sub-agent is responsible to the agent alone and not is, and is not generally responsible to the principal. A uh, substituted agent is responsible to the principal and not to the original agent who appointed him. Now in case of a sub-agency relationship, the sub-agent is responsible to the agent alone okay, and not to the principal unless and until the principal knows about it and has ratified the same because the person who is appointed a sub-agent is the agent. All right, but in the case of a substituted agency, the substituted agent is answerable to the uh, principal and not to the original agent who appointed him. The fifth difference between the two is uh, the agent is responsible to the principal for the acts of the sub-agent. Like, like we see in a normal agency relationship, the agent is answerable to the principal. So if the, if the agent goes and appoints another sub-agent, then the agent is responsible to the principal for the actions of the sub-agent because the principal did not authorize the appointment of a further sub-agent. Whereas in the case of a substituted agency, 
the agent is not responsible to the principal for the acts of the substituted agent because the substituted agent is directly in a legal relationship with the principal. The sixth difference between the two are that sub agents may be temporarily appointed, whereas substituted agents can never be improperly. I'm sorry, not temporarily, improperly. Uh, the for difference is that sub agents may be improperly appointed, whereas substituted agents can never be improperly appointed. So that means uh, the agent might not have the authority to appoint a sub agent, but still he might go and appoint a sub agent. But uh, an agent can never appoint a substituted agent without proper authority. And uh, lastly, the sub agent remains liable for the acts of the sub agent as long as a sub agency. The agent's duty ends once he has named the substituted agent. So, whenever an agent appoints a sub agent, he shall be liable for the acts of the sub agent as long as the uh, sub agency continues. But the minute an agent appoints a substituted agent, his responsibility ends. Please take about a minute, go through this, and then we proceed. Take about a minute or two, then we proceed. This is a very important slide and a good question from the examination point of view as well. Okay, now we come to the next important topic. What are the duties and obligations of an agent? So, so far we've seen what an agent means, what a sub agent means, what a substituted agent means, what is the extent of their authority, how are they appointed? All right, so now let's look at the duties and obligations of an agent. The first duty of an agent is to duty to exercise mandate. Mandate means orders. Uh, an agent is supposed to execute the orders given by the principal and act within his authority and not do any act which is beyond his authority unless and until there is an emergency situation okay the second duties uh, duty of and obligations of an agent are conduct business in accordance with the directions given by the principal so an agent's responsibility is to uh, receive the uh, directions given by the principal and conduct the business accordingly if he's been told to sell shoes in a particular geographical area he is expected to do that and should not do anything beyond that uh, it is the agent's duty to exercise reasonable care and skill. The agent should exercise reasonable care and skill while performing any job on behalf of the principal because please remember he is uh, doing a particular job on behalf of the principal. So in case he does something wrong or he does anything which is not uh, right, he is damaging the name and the image of the principal. The agent might not lose anything but the principal loses a lot of things in terms of reputation and name. So he should exercise reasonable care and skill while performing the job on behalf of the principal. It is the duty of the agent to communicate with the principal on timely matter about whatever the jobs are, whether it's finished or if he's facing any problems or uh, whatever is the current status. It is the duty of the uh, agent to always communicate with the principal and keep him in the loop. It is the duty of the uh, agent to always avoid conflicts of interest. Now what do you mean by this? This is a very interesting concept. Now, what do you mean by conflicts of interest? Conflicts of interest simply means if I am uh, telling him to sell shoes of mine under the brand name of AB, all right, and if he's already selling shoes of another competitor of mine under the brand name of CD, then that will become a conflict of interest. And that agent, when I appoint him, he should tell me that, sir, I'm, uh, I'm already uh, selling the shoes of C and D, uh, so I cannot take up the agency for your shoes because I'm already doing it. So in case he doesn't tell me this and, that, and he accepts my appointment, then there is a conflict of interest. Why, why is it a conflict of interest? Because please remember, my competitor's shoes are also being sold by him. So what is the guarantee that he will put extra efforts or put in pressure to sell my shoes? He might not. The competitor might be paying him extra commission for that. So my shoes or my business might be going down because of that. So there should be no conflict of interest. 
Then the next one is duty not to make secret profit. Now, obviously, the commission agent uh, should not make any secret profit and he should maintain complete transparency with the principal. If a particular shoe has been sold for 1000 rupees a pair and 10% commission has been uh, decided, then on 1000 he should take the 10% commission and the 900 rupees should come to me. But in case he sold the share for uh, the shoe for 1100 rupees and tells me that the shoe is only sold for 1000 rupees, so give me 100 commission, then he is making a secret profit of 100 from the sale and he is also making a secret profit of 100 from me, which is wrong. Okay. Uh, it is the duty of the agent to remit the sums after making the sales at the end of the month, week or whatever period is decided between the principal and agent. It is the duty of the agent to remit the sums uh, accurately to the principal agent either after deducting his commission or with the commission and then wait for the principal to remit the commission to him. Uh, it is also the duty of the agent to maintain accounts. The, the agent is expected to maintain his accounts on a monthly, weekly, daily basis as the case may be and uh, give the principal proper accounts of the money received by him, the commission and expenses incurred on behalf of the principal and what is the amount he is remitting to the principal. And next, and most importantly, it is the duty of the agent not to delegate his work to a sub-agent or any other person without the knowledge and permission of the principal. This will uh, sub-delegation or uh, sub-agency is not encouraged and it is the duty of the um, agent not to do this. All right. So before we can uh, proceed with the session today, let me just recollect a few things which are important and I request everyone to pay some attention to this. I would like to bring your attention to the plus platform of Hun Academy, which is a payment based subscription model and which gives you access to the world of courses, resources, content, uh, live and recorded videos and sessions of your favorite educator and topics uh, right at the convenience of your devices and your homes, which will enhance and accelerate your preparation for the CA foundation and intermediate examination. The packages provided by the plus platform of Hun Academy are for one month, three months, six months, 12 months and 24 months. The cost of the one month package is 3,500. The three months package costs rupees 8,750. The six month package costs rupees 14,000. Uh, the 12 month package costs rupees 17,500. And the 24 months package costs rupees uh, 21,000. Uh, my personal recommendation would be to go for the 12 months and 24 months package for two reasons. One is the cost effectiveness. If you see the per month cost uh, in the one month package and the per month cost in the uh, 12 months and 24 months package it's almost less than one third of what the per month package cost is and secondly as the foundation and intermediate subscription is being provided to you in one package it makes sense for you to go for the 12 months at least because normally it takes about a year's time for you to prepare for the foundation and the intermediate examination of the ca course so if you're getting the entire uh, package of ca foundation and intermediate at a cost effective price and also the duration of your preparation it really makes sense for you to go for the 12 months at least okay and while you're making a choice please do not forget to use the code pratik p-r-a-t-h-i-k uh, to get a discount of 10 percent on the listed price uh, i repeat p-r-a-t-h-i-k to get a discount of 10 percent on the listed price so the various uh, package costs after the discount is the one month package will cost you rupees 3150 the three month package will cost you rupees 7875 the six month package will cost you rupees 12600 the 12 month package will cost you rupees 15,750 and the 20, 24 months package will cost you rupees 18,900. So you see there is already an immediate savings of 10% you get when you use the code Pratik to get a discount of 10% on the uh, list price. So the plus platform uh, gives you various benefits and uh, which, which I hope you will uh, make use of and explore and I hope to see you on the plus platform very soon. Uh, these are the various special classes that I have taken on the Unacademy Learning app, which again, uh, you need, if you have not downloaded the Unacademy Learning app, please go to your Play Store and download the Unacademy Learning app and register on it using an OTP that will be sent to your mobile. And uh, using that OTP, you can register on that. It's quite simple. And then you get access to all the special classes, which are free classes uh, offered by Unacademy and also the plus platform of Unacademy, which is the payment based subscription model. Uh, these are a few of the special classes that I have taken on the Unacademy Learning app. Uh, classes on Revision Test Paper, Sale of Goods Act, Indian Contracts Act, Say Companies Act 2013, etc. Among the many other sessions that I have taken. So I request you to 
uh, get on to the Earn Academy learning app and uh, make use of this opportunity as soon as possible and uh, go through all the special classes that have been taken there by me. And you need to look me up by Pratik Gupta, P R A T H I K G U P T A. Follow my profile and go through all my special classes. And here I've also given you the links of a few of the special classes that I've taken. So if you just click on the link, it will directly take you to the Un Academy app on my profile and to the session. So I hope you make use of it. Go through my session and uh, benefit from it. There are various such topics such as Indian Contracts Act, Sale of Goods Act, Indian Partnership Act, Limited Liability Partnership Act. Companies Act, Basics of Communication, Accounting Concepts, Revision Test Papers, among many. So please get on to the Unacademy Learning app. Go through, go through all my special classes and uh, ask me if you have any questions or please give me a feedback. And also this Sunday, I will be taking a lot of special classes for you on various topics that could benefit you for your CA Foundation and Intermediate Examinations. So I request you to be there and uh, stay tuned to my classes or my sessions to know more about the special classes coming up for you. My next YouTube session is at 9 p.m. today and it is on the interpretation of statutes. So I request you to attend that session as well to gain an understanding of what you mean by interpretation of statutes. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much and uh, thank you for being a wonderful audience.